Finally, the voters get their say in this campaign. From the Battelle studio at WOSU at COSI, this is Columbus on the Record. Joining Mike Thompson this week, Jim Siegel, State House reporter for the Columbus Dispatch. Julie Carr Smythe, State House correspondent for the Associated Press. Mike Gonadakis, Republican strategist, and Joseph Moss, chairman of the Ohio Hispanic Coalition. Come Monday, the polls will be real. They will count. No more margins of error. The Ohioans caucus Monday night, and they choose their favorite candidates for Republican and Democratic nominations for president. John Kasich does not expect to do well in Iowa. His more moderate views don't appeal to the very conservative Republican Iowa caucus crowd. So that's why in this week's debate in Des Moines, when Kasich pitched his message of unity and experience, he talked right past Iowans into the voters in New England. We have to come together as a country, and we have to stop all the divisions. And you know, that's been my message in New Hampshire. And having been in New Hampshire and here in Iowa, but in New Hampshire, I just received the support of seven out of eight of the newspapers in that state because they see positive, they see unity, they see coming together, and they see a record of change and a record of accomplishment. My God, Doc, it's not too subtle there who he was talking to. No, not at all. I think of all the candidates on stage, John Kasich was the most strategic. He's been very transparent. He said, look, it's all New Hampshire bust. And last night, as you said, he talked past Iowa and looked right at New Hampshire. He had a, a captive audience to do that. And I thought last night all the establishment candidates did really well, from John Kasich to Jeb Bush to Marco Rubio. And I thought the ones that did the worst were, were the Ted Cruz. Uh, you know, I, I think him and Hillary are vying for the uh, 2016 Manchurian Candidate Award. My wife leaned over to me last night and said, Cruz just comes across as a used car salesman. So at the end of the day, last night I thought was a win for Kasich, not in Iowa, but New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. Chris Christie did well last night, who also has done pretty well in New Hampshire because of his East Coast roots. I think he does well in that kind of a format anyway. He's kind of a character and brings a little life to the stage. But I have to agree with Mike. I do think that Kasich, as I have said all along, I think he presents himself well. But then I tend to be drawn at you know, the adult candidates yeah. in the in the room and rather than, than everything else that happens to be on the stage. And as a consequence, I think he did a good job. Yeah, I think that it's interesting, though, that he did not get much attention in terms of the follow-up. I was watching uh, TV, listening to radio, and, and there are a lot of candidates up there. Yeah. And, you know, you're lucky if you get one candidate other than Trump, Cruz, and, you know, maybe maybe Rubio uh, being talked about uh, because they're all focused right on what's going to happen this Monday. And Trump wasn't even there. So right. that, was, that, was, that was the first story. Trump wasn't there, but here's what this guy did. Right. Yeah, being the, the pragmatic, uh, compassionate Republican is not getting him any traction on the morning shows or in the, edit, you know, in the newspaper columns uh, the next day. You know, K Kasich is usually rarely even mentioned, um, good or bad, which I don't know that they mind it so much, and as long as they're not being talked about too negatively, I think they just they're just hoping their message is breaking through, and he's kind of being set apart to some degree. And he continues to you can tell he just the message he brings out. He continues to to try to do that. He was one of only two candidates last night. The other one being Ben Carson, who barely said a word, yeah. uh, who didn't mention Trump or Hillary Clinton during the whole debate. Yeah. Wow. Interesting. Oh. Go ahead. <laughs> I, I think it was strategic for the, for the governor, Governor Kasich, to not uh, get involved in the Rand Paul, uh, Ted Cruz back and forth and bickering because I thought what Kasich made his points and then he stepped back and he, he accomplished his mission. So I think, you know, a lot of people say, geez, John Kasich didn't get a lot of time, but I, I think that played to his advantage. And we oh. saw this week, we saw uh, about a million dollars in negative advertising against him out in New Hampshire, and I think that shows that somebody cares. Yes, yeah. somebody does care. This week, a conservative group connected to the Koch brothers began running one of those ads against Kasich in New Hampshire. Here it is. Common Core, Obama's Medicaid expansion, tax increases. Barack Obama? No, John Kasich. Kasich still supports Common Core. Kasich was one of the few Republican governors to cheerlead Obamacare's Medicaid expansion. And Kasich's budget raised taxes by billions, hitting businesses hard and the middle class even harder. John Kasich, not a conservative, not even a moderate, an Obama Republican. American Future Fund is responsible for the content of this advertising. An Obama Republican. I've never heard those before. <laughs> Obama Republican. Julie, them, them's fighting words. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. 
Yeah, and it was there was a sneer in the in the yeah. voice too. <laughs> now does that that that's running in uh, in uh, New Hampshire conservative folks attacking his moderate stances as far as Republicans are concerned on Medicaid expansion. The tax issue is misleading because he, yes, he did raise taxes on some, but he cut more taxes on others. Right. So. There was a there was a net tax. Um, Reduction. Reduction yeah. in that particular budget, and I know that they, the, uh, the super PAC that's behind John Kasich rushed out with a FEC complaint against the ads. Um, they they sent de cease and desist letters to all the stations in the state. I mean, it, that state matters greatly to them. And it, But it's interesting that there are so many potential candidates that might have had ties to this. The Associated Press had a story saying, you know, it could have been... Uh, any number of, uh, whether it's Bush, Huckabee, yeah. uh, who who may have had an interest in that it's, running. It's dark money. It's from one of these groups and where you don't have to reveal who your donors are. And the silver lining is somebody's taking him seriously. That's th that's the danger. He's not, he's tied for a second now, basically, with Rubio and Cruz and Bush to some degree, Christie to some degree. He's gaining attention. He is. What a waste of a million dollars because the nine straight polls, as you indicated, John Kasich's in second place. So his message is resonating. Now, I heard something that there's only going to be about 240 to 260,000 people that will decide the New Hampshire Republican primary. So does that move the needle? So far it hasn't because the polls are consistent for Trump and for Kasich in this situation. On the Democratic side, Joe, do you think Bernie Sanders wins in Iowa? Is there any chance he could pull out an upset there? Great question. And, uh, you know, eight years ago I remember discussing exactly the same thing vis-a-vis -vis the Obama and Clinton campaigns. And what was making the difference then, and I think it's going to make the difference now, is organization. And I, I'm not sure what, San, uh, what Sanders is doing, but I know that Clinton is having detailed list with callbacks, with commitments to leave your house at a specific time and get to the caucus site at a specific time. I think Hillary pulls it off by a narrow margin. Because organization is key there in, yeah. in Iowa. Yeah, and I think that definitely she's um, very well organized there, has been focused a lot. And that's the difference with Obama last time. And frankly, Sanders is starting to get some pushback now. Um, I know, for example, uh, Dana Milbank, a liberal columnist in the Washington Post, recently wrote a, a pretty, pretty good piece saying why he really likes Bernie Sanders and what he has to say, but there's no way he would vote for him. And he lays out a litany of things that basically the Republicans will tear him to shreds. Because uh, his record has not yet been really looked at too hard. Uh, he, I mean, he's talking openly about pretty big tax increases to pay for things, and so I, I just think as if he can, if he does start winning and start building some momentum, you're going to see more of that kind of thing come exactly. out. Okay. Yep. Let's get to our second topic. The Ohio primary is less than two months away. Former Governor Ted Strickland does face a primary challenge from Cincinnati City Councilman P.G. Sittenfeld, but Strickland has his eye on the Republican incumbent. I'm, I've chosen not to, not, to, not to debate in this primary because my, appoint, uh, my opponent is Rob Portman. Uh, that's my responsibility. I think I'm the best guy to serve in the Senate uh, seat from Ohio to represent Ohio values. Rob Portman is currently in that seat, and I'm doing everything I can currently and have been over the last several months to focus on Rob Portman, the differences between the two of us. Julie Carr Smythe, no apologies there. He's not going to debate P.G. Sittenfeld. He's not focused on Sittenfeld. He's focused on Rob Portman. Right. He, there's nothing in it for Ted Strickland to debate P.G. Sittenfeld. Um, his, his, any positives he has would probably go down if they begin to debate and, and Sittenfeld attacks him in, a, in that kind of a forum. Um, he's better known, actually vastly better known than Portman even in the state, let alone P.G. Sittenfeld, so that debate would give Sittenfeld more name ID. Now, um, P.G. Sittenfeld is a city councilman in Cincinnati, and he's taken the gun issue as a huge uh, way of trying to call Strickland out. He's trying to keep himself in the news with interesting proposals on, uh, yesterday he came out with something on the uh, possibility that we would have a constitutional amendment to restore uh, gun rights over gun laws, uh, local control yeah. to the cities. And so he's he's trying, but there's nothing in it for Ted Strickland to do that. Joe, are you, as a Democrat, are you disappointed there's no Democratic primary debate, or do you not see the point? Do you, we can see the strategy, but for the good of the yeah. party and democracy, is it good to have well, a they, I think that the party has made 
a lot of mistakes to go around, and, and certainly the endorsement of, of uh, Strickland, that's something I have criticized uh, early on. Uh, the details as far as the debate or not debate, I, I think that's more of a strategic decision to be made by the respective parties. I think uh, that uh, Strickland has, uh, you know, he not to, he nothing to gain uh, to do that. I agree with you 100%, uh, Julie. So uh, that's a decision that they made. Jimmy's running, Ted Strickland's running kind of a populist campaign. He's, you know, big on labor unions, harping on the, the wage gap, on he's very much anti-trade deals, the TPP, the, the Trans-Pacific uh, Pact, he's mm -hmm. against that. He's going for that sort of Sherrod Brown, blue-collar, white, working-class vote. Oh, I think, I think you're right, because I, I think he's seen how well Sherrod Brown has done in his two elections, and running on that kind of a message, and he, I'm sure he kind of fancies himself as being, uh, you know, in that mold. And um, but I mean, I'm not sure he's Sherrod Brown. Sherrod Brown comes across, I think, uh, you know, has a more charisma and, and more forcefulness. I think when he brings out that message. But, um, but yeah, I mean, that you know, he's playing to the, definitely playing to his base now. And he, you know, he'll, he, you know, he's been criticized some on the gun issue, and he's kind of trying to walk the line a little bit. Uh, my guess is you'll see him skip back over the line uh, for the general election and start talking a little more about his uh, support of, of gun rights. And uh, Rob Portman still kind of flies under the radar, but he did a lot of ads running, both by his campaign and by PAC supporting him. Um, how much does he have to worry about down the road? I, he doesn't have to worry about either of them. He's going to win re-election easily. He's, his war chest continues to grow, and combined, uh, the Sittenfeld and Strickland together can't even compare to what, what Rob Portman has in support, but but I think uh, you know Strickland's campaign is so weak and embarrassing. I mean, uh, Brent Larkin at the Plain Dealer just wrote a scathing column about Strickland last week, and the only reason he's there is because the party bosses rigged the endorsement form. As Joe said, he was critical of that in the past, and rightfully so. But at the end of the day, um, leaders in Akron and other big cities are coming out and endorsing Sittenfeld now. It's organic, and he's got a long way to go. But if you can't get behind Ted Strickland now, when are you going to get behind him? He still has a huge lead in the Democratic Party. He is yeah, the party yeah. the most well-known statewide Democrat right now. I mean, well, and it's an unfortunate situation for the Democrats because they don't have, um, uh, they lost every election last time. They don't have a, a deep bench to, to pull from. They should be encouraging candidates like P.G. Sittenfeld yeah, right. at some yes, level. Absolutely. But what's yeah. happening is that uh, that's the race they're going for because there's nothing in the state that they can offer to a candidate because the Republicans are, are holding all of those seats. And, and, you know, at the end of the day, and Mike gave you his predictions, I'll give you mine. Very simple. If Clinton wins Ohio, then Strickland wins Ohio. That, that was my question to Mike. Who's a bigger threat to Rob Portman, Ted Strickland or Donald Trump? Well, I think that's a great debate that we could have uh, ultimately, but uh, I, I'm not ready to. Con I'm not convinced that Hillary Clinton will be the nominee because it's deja vu. But if Trump is the nominee, that hurts Portman. Well, yeah, it probably does. Let's be let's be frank here. Um, I think it, it will hurt across the board, but uh, you know, uh, we live in the greatest country in the world, and people will elect who they think is best. I mean, I can say I've talked to some campaign folks out there, and they in the Republican side, and they are just terrified of, of a Trump nomination, not because they necessarily think they'll lose, but they don't really know what it'll do to their to their electorate. They don't know who will start showing up to the polls. Well, and it's not only uh, in the presidential. I mean, the, the Democrats have run a, a candidate against every one of the incumbent congressional candidates for yeah. the same reason that if, the, if Trump should be the nominee, they think they have a chance. Okay. Mm -hmm. Governor Kasich can say he supports defunding Planned Parenthood, but he won't be able to say he did it, at least not before voters in Ohio, in Iowa and New Hampshire make their choices. The Ohio Senate this week voted to strip state funding from Planned Parenthood. It's just short of one and a half million dollars. The House has already approved defunding, but because the two bills are different, it'll take another couple of weeks before the governor can sign it into law. Jim Siegel, one and a half million dollars, how, this is pretty symbolic, is it? It's not really gonna affect Planned Parenthood's budget that much, it's about 5%, right? Right, I mean, it'll have an effect, yep. but yeah, there there is definitely, you know, uh, some sending of a message here, uh, and and you know sometimes that's that's not a bad thing either. I mean, if you're you know if you truly believe in, you know, and you're you're anti-abortion and you you truly despise Planned Parenthood because of what they do on that end, and it it drives you enough that you think they should be defunded, you know that that's a debate to have. And but yeah, I don't know that you know I don't know that it ultimately you know causes Planned Parenthood. A tremendous amount of pain. I mean, it does compound on top of some lost funding they got last uh, a couple years ago when they passed a, a different measure involving family planning dollars that they diverted away from the 
the organization. But it's just a, a continue, you know. But but I know Planned Parenthood and their supporters feel like they're just it's just a continuing attack against them for things that they cannot spend public money to do anyway. So. And, and that's the word. It's a, it's an attack. Um, none of this money, none of the governmental money, either federal or state, goes for the performing of abortions. The organization does perform some abortions. Uh, Mike, I think it's about a third in the state of Ohio or Correct. something along those lines. However, this particular defunding is punitive and punitive only, not because the money is going to abortion, but they want to hit back on uh, Planned Parenthood because of that small percentage that they, that they of, of their business that they happen to Small to percentage of their them. business, but a lot of their revenue comes from abortion services. Planned yes. Parenthood. I mean, uh, some of the, the, when you look at the revenue, that comes from abortion, but it's only a small percentage of the other things. Of their they, work. It's a small percentage of the work is, is actually abortion. So the rest has to do yeah. with women's health. But it was interesting that they went forward with it despite this week there was this um, uh, court decision that, that said that the video that has sparked a lot of this across the country um, they did not find the um, those who they did find that the makers of that. They found that Planned Parenthood didn't do anything wrong. Right. So, so if, 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 the, if the judge in Texas said there was nothing done wrong, Mike Dewine said here there's been nothing wrong. Why this defunding push? Okay, well, a couple questions here. We got to clear, let's clarify, please. And all due respect to my colleagues here on the panel, uh, let's talk about Texas first. What happened in Texas was a travesty because what the uh, what the prosecutor said is we're going to indict the guy who bought the aborted baby body parts, but we're not going to indict the Planned Parenthood who sold it. How can you buy something unless someone well, they didn't sells indict it? him for buying? They indicted no, him for faking an two ID. Count, no, two counts: one fake ID and one for purchasing Attempting to purchase. Uh, purchase. Yeah. So yeah. there, so they proved our case that they were that they were going to sell them to him. So what we've said from the beginning is. There's two states that did it, Oregon and California. And what we asked Ohio and the other 11 states is, hey, if it's happening in California and Oregon, can we make sure it's not happening in Ohio and these other states? Thankfully, it wasn't. These The, the investigations found out. So um, let's just to, for clarifying sure. that issue. Um, as it relates to defunding Planned Parenthood in Ohio, we have an organization, Planned Parenthood, by their own admission, that sees 60,000 patients a year. 60,000 a year in their annual report. We live in a state of 11.9 million people, yet Planned Parenthood gets... 90, 95 percent of all these all these revenues. What we're saying is, there's p women in, in Eastern Ohio, Appalachia, Ohio, the poorest part of our state. There's no Planned Parenthoods there. Let's make sure that these community health centers that are seeing those women have access to those funds. Planned Parenthood shouldn't get all the money. That's all we're saying. Are, they, are these community centers in these rural areas equipped to it? Because that's what we keep hearing. We saw a report this week in Texas when they lost the Planned Parenthood lost their money. These women had nowhere to go. They had to drive four or five hours to get. I think control. it's very disrespectful to say that there aren't equipped uh, places. If you talk to Phil Cole with the Community Action agencies of Ohio. They're a very liberal group. They are offended that there's this rumor out there by Planned Parenthood saying that they're not equipped to do it. The only people that offer health care in Southeast Ohio are the community action agencies, and they're ready to go. Now, let me clarify. And Mike, did I hear you say that the grand jury found that there was a sale of, of parts? Because I believe that the grand jury what they found was there was no sale of parts well, and no purchase of parts. That, well, obviously they haven't released the grand jury testimony yet, but what the DA said in, pu in subsequent interviews to the media was that's why they indicted him. So let's wait till the grand jury testimony. They indicted him for that's trying to buy fetal to parts. Indict. Correct. So but if, they, you, they, if they, you go to a bank and you say, I want to rob you, but you don't, uh, you don't get it, you get, you get a charge with attempted robbery. Okay. So that's what they basically have charged him with. Yeah. But, they, but they let Planned Parenthood go scot-free. They because didn't they said they, they didn't do anything. Yeah. Anyway, Jim, on the timing of this, I'm curious why it didn't get done before the, the Iowa caucus and the Hampshire primary. Well, that's a good question. This, these bills were introduced four months ago. Yeah. They have now been passed three times, and they still isn't, the bill is still not sitting on the governor's desk waiting for his signature. Uh, most recent, you know, th this past week, uh, the Senate passed it. The House decided to adjourn and go home rather than wait until the Senate was done with its finish, you know, with, with doing its business. The Senate delayed its session. The Senate then did a, a goodbye speech beforehand, which delayed another hour. So it, it th now they all, of course, say, no, no, there, there's nothing. We, this is just how it worked out, and he'll get the bill eventually, and he'll sign it, and it'll be fine. But, but I've got to believe that Governor Kasich, if he really wanted to sign this bill this week, he would have signed the bill this week. Here's a conspiracy theory. <laughs> it, defunding Planned Parenthood does not go over well in more moderate New Hampshire, but it will go over well in conservative South Carolina. Uh, Maybe it, it's it may, good timing after all. <laughs> well, well, the governor of New Hampshire signed defunding Planned Parenthood four months ago, so it does go over well. Well, in he's not on the ballot. He's he not on the ballot, but, but Kelly obviously Ayotte, he, Republicans yeah. in New Hampshire support it. No, six, well, it's a, it's a one poll, so 66% of, of New Hampshire women opposed 
defunding Planned Parenthood. An independence Parenthood. vote in New Hampshire. And I think that for Kasich, that um, he, for his entire governorship, he sort of tried to have the abortion issue both ways. He's worked very quietly behind the scenes to to get uh, things to come and not come to his desk. Yeah. And then, um, you know, he on the surface can say that he's... Um, you know, being moderate on an issue that's quite divisive when you're trying to win a, a presidential race. All right. The situation is not as dire as the water crisis in Flint, Michigan, but in Ohio City has also been drinking water contaminated with lead. Tests show water from a Sebring, Ohio treatment plant is contaminated with high levels of lead in copper. Sebring is about an hour southeast of Cleveland. It also came out this week that state officials knew about the contamination but did not report it. The Columbus Dispatch reports state officials knew of the high lead levels in October but did not make the news public until last week. The AP reports the Ohio EPA accused the plant's operator of mismanagement as far back as 2009. Julie Carsmythe, how big a deal is this delay in reporting? This is not quite as bad as Flint, but it's yeah. smacks of it. Um, I think that um, the EPA is is today saying that they um, they're taking some of the of the blame for that and saying that they didn't act quickly enough um, and that uh, it's I know that they want Craig Butler some people want Craig Butler to resign as a result of it. He's the um, director of the right. EPA. Yep. But one of the the intervening factors I guess that they're talking about is that the actual reporting to the EPA has 30 and 60 day delays in it mm -hmm. so that the system is set up in a way that it isn't always clear whether this stuff's being neglected mm -hmm. for periods of time. It could be bureaucracy. Right. The big question is how safe how safe is our water? How safe is our, are our pipes? You know, I think that this certainly is going to uh, suggest that some people ought to have their water tested. I think that people are going to be suspicious as to the quality of the water and uh, certainly improve the sales of bottled water in plastic containers. Well, the thing is that the, uh, you know, I think the Sebring thing became a huge deal um, because of Flint yep. and because it suddenly became a political hot potato where um, s this kind of stuff is probably happening all over the state all the time and I'm sure somebody will be will be looking at those yeah. patterns as this unfolds but it's um, you know when it becomes in the political spotlight you start to learn about processes you haven't been paying attention to. Look at to our last topic real quick. It's a big topic, but if there is one thing this election cycle has shown, it's that a lot of voters are upset, angry at where the country is heading. This week, NPR and WOSU tried to look at the reasons for this voter anxiety and anger. They include stagnant wages, the gap between the rich and the not rich, terrorism, rhetoric, rhetoric over immigration, and now lead in our water. Joe Mas. How compare this level of anxiety to the Vietnam War era or the gas yeah. crisis era in the 70s? Is it oh, any different, really? Oh, yeah, and I'm so glad you bring that up. Now, on the Democratic side, the anxiety is over wealth disparity and gerrymandering, something that I mention all the time. On the Republican side, the cult cultural changes, which has the, the, the issues of immigration, has a racial dimension, moral values, LGBT issues, obsession with the religious component of terrorism and so on. And, and this is a unique thing of, of, of current times. Now, back during the Vietnam War that you mentioned, we had people for and we had people against the war, but we all had the same sources of information. We had Walter Cronkite. Now, today, depending on where you sit, you're either going to watch Fox News or you're going to see CNN or MSNBC or WOSU. But all the, all the cable nets are showing Donald Trump 24-7. It is. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And you add to that conservative talk radio, and you have today's anxious reality. And liberal talk radio. Yeah. I mean, I think that the uh, role of the journalist, too, is... Um, called into question. You know, at that time during the Vietnam War, there were sort of trusted sources that people could say, okay, parse this for me. Take this and take this. Tell me a little bit about those sides. And, and that role has also been called into question, which is a very anxious um, way of people don't know who to believe and, and uh, right. who to trust. I'll have to leave the anxiety there. Time for our off the record parting shots. Joe Moss, you're up first. Thanks, uh, Mike. Um, I want to mention about uh, something that's been in the dispatch for the past week about a group of about 60 Section 8 housing residents of 
Bryden House apartments are going to be evicted. And this was because this was done without explanation. The residents are primarily elderly and disabled people. What happened is that the apartments were purchased by Brighton Management LLC out of New Jersey, and they found a loophole by which they thought they could make more money by getting them out. I have a prediction uh, that starting this Monday, they will start feeling a pushback from the community, and their purchase of Brighton will not look as bright <laughs> as it once did. Mike, um, this week the House of Representatives, the GOP-led House, passed legislation that would audit, set up a performance audit standards for our university systems, two years and four years, and guess who opposed it? Our four-year universities. Now, they did it quietly, Ohio State in the lead. They refused to testify, but my sources are telling me they're going to do everything they can to kill it in the Senate. Why? Julie. I'm just going to do a plug for a little bill I'm following that would add the right flyer to the Ohio State seal. This is part of this whole push of Ohio to um, claim and reclaim the, the rights of the Wright brothers to first in flight after a Connecticut passed a law that said they weren't. Okay. And I think that right flyer still won't make it into the seal. And Jim? Uh, I'll just predict that the uh Planned Parenthood bill will eventually make it to Governor Kasich's desk, and he'll sign it and and, and utilize it for uh, whatever primaries lie ahead for him. We moderators are always looking for ways to cut off debate. Cliff Rosenberger showed us how. He cut off a long-winded <laughs> preacher by slipping in an amen and then immediately going to the Pledge of Allegiance. That's what I'm going to do from now on when people go on too long. He's going to say amen and I pledge allegiance. <laughs> that is Columbus on the Record for this week. Check us out online, Facebook, Twitter. Uh, our website, WOSU.org. For our crew and for our panel, I'm Mike Thompson. Have a good week.